Hello, I'm going to be talking about the Moravians today. So originally, they were from the Czech Republic. They settled in Pennsylvania in 1741. They had towns like Bethlehem, Nazareth, uh, Hope, New Jersey, Philadelphia, uh, as well as one in Staten Island as well. And then, under the leadership of Bishop Spagenberg, they went down to North Carolina. They got 100,000 acres that they called Wachovia. Uh, I think that's how you say it. Uh, towns were then built up, Bethabora, Bethania, and then eventually Salem in 1766. Uh, just so you know, a little knowledge about the current day Moravians. Moravian College is still around in Bethlehem, and a uh, notable Moravian you might know was Andy Griffith. He was actually raised a Baptist, and they said that he changed his faith and was actually thinking about going into Moravian ministry. So there's a little extra knowledge for you. So Hendrick's article really talks about the cultural and societal lifestyle, how the towns were set up, how they interacted with each other and others, um, how they viewed themselves. They lived in a kind of self-segregated society. Uh, they were segregated by choir. So that was the young boys would live with young boys, girls, youths, then it go up to married husbands and wives, and then as up to widowers and Widowies, I guess. Um, the choirs ate, slept, and prayed by choir. Even the married couples, uh, they didn't live together. You lived by your choir. This was kind of built a sense of togetherness in the community itself. Uh, and this was kind of, you see this played out when they were actually buried with their choir member and not with their family member. This was to accentuate the feeling of an heavenly sense rather than an earthly sense. The important lies not on earth but in heaven. Hendrix then also talks about the economy, which is basically time and labor for shelter, food, and clothing. And then after the community was self-sufficient, they would wean themselves off this. And then he talked about how these communities weren't really agriculture-based. They were production and trade-based, so they needed people, outsiders, to come in to buy their goods and wares. They had taverns and boarding schools, but really the otherness of these towns was really seen. Uh, they would actually have somebody come in and give almost informative tour guides to keep these outsiders from disrupting the day-to-day -day basis of life. And even with the taverns, they would not allow windows to be on the ground level so the children couldn't go in and peek their heads and the parents who had their children in Moravian boarding schools were brought and made to lodge in the tavern itself not in the town. Now something else I found interesting was how they decided a lot of things in Moravian life by the drawing of lots. This goes into major structures as well as towns themselves so I thought that was very interesting that they would put three pieces of paper into a hat, yes, no, and a blank piece of paper, and then choose where they would do certain things by what that paper said. And Hendrick says there was really purpose in the placement of everything in Moravian uh, towns, and even towns themselves. So while a few Moravians actually fought in the war, uh, the large majority were pacifists. That's actually their religious tenet, is that they're, they didn't believe in fighting. Uh, they were, these Moravian congregation townships were places that the author calls uh, places of healing and production. His name is uh, Weinlich's article. Uh, so building up to the war, they kind of favored the British, and he gives a few reasons why they did. He says for religious and secular reasons uh, that in 1749, the British Parliament accepted them as a pacifist body, which means they didn't have to take oaths or serve in mandatory military uh, service and also for religious reasons as well. Um, due to this, Wachovia was burdened with heavy taxes and fines in America. And then uh, in the Test Act of 1777, they were faced with banishment and confiscation of the goods if they didn't swear an allegiance. They got away with only affirming their oath without having to swear their allegiance. The overarching theme throughout all of these is really that the Wachovia area in North Carolina was really taken advantage of. While they acted as places of to, for soldiers to get well, like hospitals and supply areas, they were really 
plundered by both the British and the Americans. There was a story in one article where under Cornwallis, these women were up all night cooking for him. And by the morning, they actually took 23 horses, 30 heads of cattle, all the poultry, and the, some entire houses were gone by morning. But this wasn't just the British now. On the American side, there was a story where they kind of gave you a rundown of the day of Moravian dealing with uh, having to deal with troops in the town. So by 4 o'clock, troops were coming in demanding brandy, meat, uh, bread and flour, and powder. And they would receive brandy, meat, bread and flour, but didn't get the powder. Then at 7, they came back, went to the tavern, ate and drank all they want, and they left with three bundles of oats, a hundred pounds of meat, a half an ox, gallons of brandy, and all the public lead they had. So when the war finally ended, I can only imagine how glad these people were that the war ended. So I, when the Daily Beast article talks about how they were the first community to celebrate the 4th of July, and it's not really for the founding of a new American nation, but for peace, I can see this in their solemn pres- uh, marches and how they viewed themselves and how this war, they were just glad that God had given them finally a peace.